Intel's next generation 14 nanometer microarchitecture for climate and soil, the next R. The idea is to give you a short introduction, go over some of the key areas of innovation that we uh, focus on on this uh, family of products, and then talk about the CPU microarchitecture on the chipset, and then uh, more importantly, graphics and media as well. So most of you are familiar with Intel's uh, TikTok strategy. Uh, we have implemented this for the last three process nodes. Uh, but for those of you who are uh, not familiar with it, a tick refers to a year where we focus on improving, uh, the, uh, changing the process generation and not a significant focus on microarchitecture. And we alternate it with a year in a talk where we focus on keeping on the same process as the previous year, but improving the microarchitecture significantly. So in this cadence, uh, 14 nanometer would be our talk for the microarchitecture. It would be uh, the Haswell would, uh, would be a tick. Haswell was the talk, and Wardwell is the tick. And uh, uh, as you have heard about the 14 nanometer process for Mark, Kirk, VK, and others, it delivers uh, industry-leading performance um, at uh, amazing form factors, at uh, incredible battery lives, even compared to uh, one-year-old uh, uh, tablets based on the Haswell family. Um, although the focus uh, so, so far has been, uh, except in uh, the keynote, has been a lot on tablets and uh, fan response factors, one thing to remember is that the 14 nanometer microarchitecture, similar to Haswell and Generation before that, is the key building block for a broad range of products, uh, starting from tablets and all the way up to uh, uh, multi-core, multi-socket uh, Xeon servers and data centers. It's the core building block, which, uh, which is expressed in multiple form factors and multiple SOCs across the performance and power spectrum. So uh, one, of the, uh, one of the more um, uh, amazing form factors is the Intel Core M processor. And we bring in a bunch of technologies in there to enable those sleek form factors that you saw in Kirk's demo this morning. The, and I'll, I'll list them and I'll go into a little bit of detail on each one of them on the successive parts. First is definitely the process. We have 14 nanometer second generation Trigate transistors and a whole range of innovations in that process in order to enable fanless and uh, high dynamic range and uh, low active power uh, workloads. We also have spent a fair amount of time in ensuring that we have building blocks to allow OEMs and ODMs to control thermals and power at a system level in order to customize the hardware to the uh, platform materials and platform uh, thermals of their choice. Uh, we have spent enormous effort on reducing the SOC idle power. This is the power when um, the SOC is perhaps on and uh, associated with a Wi-Fi but not uh, actively doing anything. And uh, also we have, uh, we have worked on making sure that the absolute dynamic range between the idle and maximum performance is higher, which allows you to, within the constraints of thermal and power, allows you to burst higher and faster. <laughs> We have second generation fiber. Fiber was the fully integrated VR, which allows you to uh, incorporate uh, elements of the voltage regulation technologies on the CPU socket and reduce platform footprint and increase uh, VR efficiency. And we also uh, added something called 3DL, which further enables uh, higher efficiencies for voltage regulation, especially at low loads, as in uh, fan response factors. And then um, Aditya and uh, Hong will go over the next generation graphics media display. Even though Bordwell is a tick, uh, graphics in the previous three generations has been on a punishing kegger. We have uh, significantly invested on microarchitecture, architecture, and system level driver performance and improving user visible graphics and media performance uh, at pretty much on a yearly cadence. And in the case of uh, the Intel Core M, this is all expressed in very low power levels and in very sleek form factors. Uh, the chipset is an essential component of the Bordwell uh, 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 platform. You have the CPU and the chipset which go together to give you the full connectivity of the platform. And typically when the CPU is idle, uh, the chipset is still active. So we invested a fair amount of effort in making sure that the chipset also reduces the idle power and allow more hooks in, uh, uh, in managing the active power of the chipset to overall reduce the platform idle and active power. So, 
That was an overview of what the Intel core processor got, and for the rest of the presentation, I'll walk you through the uh, building blocks of what allows us to get us there. So fine-grained PCH power management. So the PCH has a bunch of I.O. in there and has a bunch of domains, PCI Express, USB, audio, and a whole range of I.O. logic. And what we have worked is making sure that based on what workload is active, that section of the PCH only is active and the other portions can power down. This again allows power to scale with the workload that's required. We also added PCI Express storage, audio DSP upgrades to add more features to the PCH. Also, uh, to deliver those usages at our industry leading um, low power levels. At the overall CPU, with the inclusion of the process and the microarchitecture, we've been able to reduce the idle power by 60% compared to the previous generation, which was introduced last year, and 30% lesser actual power at, at the same performance. One of the features of the process which I'll, I think is coming up is that you can deliver more, power, more performance at the same power or you can deliver or you can significantly reduce power at the same performance. On the graphics side, we've added support for OpenCL 2.0, uh, DirectX 11.2, DirectX 12 and OpenGL 4.3. And Aditya will cover a significant architecture innovation called shared virtual memory which allows you know, for the first time in, uh, in high volume uh, integrated graphics to uh, have processes shared run on the CPU and graphics in shared virtual memory. No need to do any address translation because they're sharing the same view of memory. On the core side, we have improved the IPC. Um, this is a constant cadence we do every year at our Talk. We have uh, improved the fundamental building blocks uh, for computation in both floating point and vector. Uh, we have uh, targeted crypto speed up. Cryptographic uh, operations has been a focus for Intel, and uh, we have consistently either added new instructions or sped up old instructions over the past four generations of CPUs, and Broadwell um, is no exception. And as I said, the, at the overall power delivery, second generation 5 and 3DL allows you to uh, improve the efficiency at uh, which the CPU operates. So in terms of the process, right, there are many aspects to the process uh, which we bring to bear. Um, and uh, you have seen some of these in previous presentations and press releases. I'll just lightly touch on some of them. The key factors are basically what is the capacitance uh, uh, of, the, of the process, what is the lowest minimum voltage that you can operate, what is the dynamic range, and also leakage. When you're idle and not doing anything, you're your transistors are leaking. So if you if you focus on all three of them, which is what we have on Broadwell, um, and especially in the core M flavor, you get a part which can idle at a very low power, which can, thanks to fiber, uh, instantaneously burst to a turbo, which is enabled by fiber very quickly, and can come down uh, and shut down at a very fine granularity, thanks to the microarchitecture innovations. And of course, uh, last but not the least, area scaling is always good to enable a larger number of features in, in the same given area of uh, transistor budget. So power management, uh, in, a, in, a, in a constrained form factors, power management is pretty much the name of the game. Uh, everybody has uh, performance and, uh, uh, and headroom to burn it, but how efficiently you manage the power and how efficiently you manage the system is what differentiates platforms uh, from each other. So uh, again, given that this is an uh, ODM and developer oriented, I'm going to go over some basics which some of you may already know. At a platform, we have three what we call platform level limits. One is the short term limit. Um, the uh, rather the one of them is the long term limit where you can effectively sustain the uh, platform indefinitely. The next one is a burst limit for an instantaneous period of time based on uh, user user need and the thermal budget. You can uh, burst the uh, various elements of the platform, uh, the CPU graphics or even the PCH. And finally, you have the PL3, which is the protection of the battery. Uh, you do not want to exceed that, else you risk catastrophic damage to the battery. What we allow is, we allow these parameters to be set individually on a per system basis, and OEMs have the capability to set these, and then we deliver tools which allow uh, the OEMs to test the settings that they have across a variety of workloads and thermal settings to verify that the part behaves in accordance to their expectations and delivers a good uh, end user experience. 
They've improved the efficiency of fiber. Excuse me. What we do is the power management hardware in the SOC monitors peak demand, and in tablet modes and in fanless modes, uh, most of the time, most but not all the time, the average power draw is fairly small. You're browsing a website, you're uh, you know, playing uh, cut the rope or some casual gaming, the power draw is small, so you don't need the full capability of the hardware on tap. So what we do is we reduce the input voltage to the fiber to allow the fiber to improve its efficiency towards uh, lower operating power. We also have, uh, uh, this allows us to uh, minimize the power delivery at power, power draws or system power configurations less than 6 watts, at, which is definitely in the range where the uh, Broadwell uh, fanless tablets are aimed at. We also have non-linear group control to allow us to improve the efficiency at uh, higher current draws, higher instantaneous current draws. This translates to uh, um, a 5% speed of response, which in turn translates to an uh, increased power savings because you can get the job done that, that much quicker and then shut down. Managing excursions, um, we have in the past, we have had uh, two mechanisms for managing thermal uh, excursions. Uh, one is the uh, core CPU frequency throttling. Um, under system control and under firmware control, we can vary the C uh, frequency of the CPU. We've had the graphics frequency of throttling. Um, it was first, uh, we had the capability before, but uh, environment-based throttling was first introduced on Haswell. Um, what we've introduced new on Broadwell is what we call chipset of throttling. And the idea here is when you're, um, when you're focused on a workload which is user interactive or responsive, and let's say you have a USB stick or uh, plugged in Ethernet and you're downloading you know, your favorite movie or, or some songs to your iPod, the more important subject to experience comes from there being no lag in the uh, application that you're looking at. And it's okay for the background data transfer to run a little bit slower for the duration of the thermal spike. So we allow the, under, under firmware control, we allow the uh, chipset to reduce the uh, IO transfer speed in order to keep the thermal budget for the uh, interactive CPU or graphics worker. And uh, this is a more detail of what I just said, right? So for example, if you have a SATA interface or even a PCI Express or, or a USB device, we basically insert uh, delay cycles to allow um, the system to recover thermal headroom. This effect and each one of these uh, effect effectively builds up in terms of thermal headroom and you can get up to a 50% power reduction in terms of the I.O. power consumed, and that in turn translates to more headroom for CPU and graphics over the uh, duration. <clears throat> so this is a busy graph. I'll try to, uh, I'll try to simplify it. Uh, and there's also a nice picture on the, on the next uh, chart to illustrate what points this is trying to make. So in any process, in any uh, system configuration, there is an efficient voltage at which you want to operate which basically balances leakage, balances dynamic power, balances the uh, performance of the power and gives you the most efficient point. Now, if you, in a, in a fixed thermal budget, like you have in a fanless, if you continue to operate a fairly um, heavy duty game, there'll be a point at which you reach the minimum voltage at which your um, graphics or CPU wants to operate and, and operating any below that, you only get into linear scaling. So at that point, it may actually, it is actually more efficient to what we call duty cycle the part. You recognize the par point at which you approach the inefficient point, shut down the graphics or CPU engine, recover the thermal headroom, and then be able to run at a higher frequency to be more efficient. And uh, we've done this in uh, the first generation of this was enabled in the uh, Haskell family fanless tablets, and it was fairly well received by some of the tech uh, publications, including one of my favorite quotes, uh, from uh, Anantech, which calls it uh, a bit of brute force and a bit of genius. But the key of, the, of this technique, which we have further elaborated and extended on Broadwell, is to recognize that, you know, run fast and shut down is actually more efficient than run slow at a less efficient point. So this is an example of duty cycle control in action. So you start off your system is cool, everything can run at the nominal frequency. And let's say you're running a benchmark or a long workload, um, you know, your skin heats up, your TJ rises at some point, you, uh, the firmware decides that the thermal rod allow the part to operate 
um, you know, higher than a particular voltage. At that point, it signals the graphics or, or the driver to say, hey, I want you to shut down. The driver in turn looks for an optimal point because it's actually running the workload. It can't just drop things on the floor. They're state to be safe. It determines an optimal point and then shuts it down and then the firmware monitors and then when the thermals are, uh, improve to a point where it can um, begin operation again, you start and then you continue. The difference on uh, Broadwell is that on the previous generation, you were able to do this only on frame boundaries. Um, yeah. um, being able to shut down graphics on Broadwell, you can actually do the shut it down on batch buffer mm -hmm. boundaries. Um, effectively, graphics had, had to add more state management in order to allow this. But the net of this is that you get much more fine-grained uh, uh, power savings and the ability to run higher workloads in a uh, thermal on the web. The, oops. the other enhancements are C-state enhancements to average power. C-state is what we call processor, uh, you know, uh, CPU states. Uh, C0 uh, translates to fully active and then C10 is when the platform is in uh, complete off. So we've added enhanced uh, C7 to, um, to improve the uh, average power. So we have a set of linear regulators. The fiber is, uh, um, allows high dynamic range, but when you have a very light load, you do not need the full power of fiber. So you have a linear voltage regulators which are much more efficient uh, at those low power levels. We switch them on. We also reduce the fiber input voltage to um, to a lower value from the nominal one in order to further reduce the static losses. However, in this scenario, we still um, support paths to memory to enable pop-ups. Pop-ups are what um, uh, Wi-Fi ping to say, are you, are you there, are you there? In the, in the previous generation, we had to wake the entire CPU up in order to wake the memory path up. In this generation, even when the platform is in the C7 state, we still enable the path to memory to allow that ping to go through um, at a reduced uh, overall power level. And the net net of this is uh, over the duration of a uh, period of time, you, you continue to accumulate credit for the power you saved. And as you can see in key scenarios like Windows Idle or video playback or web browsing, it uh, translates to significant power reduction versus uh, the previous generation. So I gave you a flavor for some of the uh, techniques that we have to enable uh, microarchitecture power level power reduction, but the focus didn't stop there, right? Intel has an array of, uh, of tools that we offer to the OEMs to manage power and uh, thermals at a system level. Uh, let me just build this out and I'll, I'll talk through it. So pretty much all of the key components, so processor, processor graphics, the PCH, the memory, wireless LAN, wireless WAN, the battery charger, and the skin thermals. We have the ability to detect temperature and have the ability to control the rate at which they operate. So this is again, um, there are built-in defaults, especially for the SOC components, but at a platform level, we have all of these uh, knobs that we allow the OEM or the ODM to basically tweak and uh, and, uh, and have flexibility in designing the platform to optimize the experience to in whichever direction that is optimal for them. The one, um, and, and then display, and of course, in the case of fanless, this is not necessarily required, but we also have this control for the other versions of Broadway which will come along at, uh, at a higher power levels and also in the uh, laptop and traditional segments. So one example of, of these technologies in action is uh, the uh, Intel uh, DPTF where we do act, active skin temperature management where again, I, I gave you an example in, uh, a couple of slides ago is where the system is cold, you run your benchmark, you get a you know, great score, then, then things are a little warmer, you run it again and, uh, and in order to make sure that the uh, skin temperature that the user feels is, is held to a nominal amount, you don't want the uh, user to actually um, uh, be uncomfortably hot holding the case of the tablet. Uh, the score gets a little lower, and then this continues, which is why you know you could see a substantial uh, one term variation between scores. So if you're trying to do apples to apples comparison, you know you either uh, pick the first one for a benchmark or you pick the last one. What you want to do is not pick the first one in one and the last one in the other. Again, this is familiar, but I just want to point out that we have uh, technology in this to allow uh, the performance to reduce as a function of time and still keep the tablet comfortable to hold. 
Okay, so uh, fair amount on uh, power management. Let me uh, turn to CPU microarchitecture for a little bit. Um, one of the key innovations in Broadwell was the focus on uh, power efficient performance. In the past, we worked on a one is to one rule where we said uh, if it uh, delivered, uh, you know, uh, one x uh, ten percent performance, it should uh, not consume. It should not add more than uh, ten percent power for the performance you're delivering. For Broadwell, we changed the rule. We said if you're going to deliver 10% uh, performance, you shouldn't consume more than 5% power. So as a result, the uh, performance addition was, uh, was, uh, was energy efficient, and, uh, and, it, and it shows in the net result of uh, being able to deliver a solid 5% average and 5 to 8% across a range of workloads uh, with this microarchitecture. Some of the elements were a larger scheduler, a larger TLBs, um, and one of the features which is my favorite is a um, is a second page mishandler. When you miss the TLDs, you can have now two um, uh, translations in parallel, and uh, this this is a, a significant improvement for the cases where you are um, having a lot of TL TLD misses. We also added uh, significant floating point of vector improvements, which I'll get into the next file. But the key message on this is that every generation for the past, uh, I guess that's uh, 10 years, we have continuously delivered uh, uh, IPC improvement, whether it's a tick or a talk. And I did the arithmetic. If you go back to the last seven generations, which was Spender, we now the Godwell is effectively ignoring uh, power, effectively a 50% single third performance improvement in the last seven years. So, uh, in vector performance, or uh, specifically in floating point, uh, traditionally we have tried to improve the building blocks in a way which does not require software to be recompiled. This is the highest ROI for any developer. You don't have to do any work, your code just runs faster. So one of the, uh, our floating point and integer latencies are already fairly superlative, um, but one of the areas where we are able to improve is reducing our FP multiple latency down to three clocks from four clocks. We also uh, took a look at the uh, performance profile for uh, HPC applications and realize that uh, once you made the um, building blocks fast, then you know, Amdahl's law says that the slow points stick out. So we took a crack at uh, speeding the divider. So we went from a Radix 16 divider on Haswell to a Radix 1024 divider on, on Broadwell. And we also um, are now able to schedule scalar dividers simultaneously. So this definitely results in a significant improvement in the latency of a divide and also on a throughput in from a st starting one divide uh, to the ending of the previous one. We also improved gather. Gather was an instruction which was introduced on Haswell to um, allow general purpose uh, gather to work well. If you, I mean, the caveat is that if you know what you're doing in terms of gather, if you have a specific function, it is probably faster to write it yourself. But if the number of cases that you have to work for need are varied, then using a general purpose instruction eases coding. And uh, we have achieved a 60% reduction in the number of micro-ops versus the previous generation. And we also worked on latency and uh, throughput improvements in certain cases, all without requiring any software uh, change to improve performance. Cryptography has been a, a significant area of focus for Intel ever since the uh, uh, Westmere generation, which was the TIC or the 32 nanometer. And we've added uh, building blocks ever since, and uh, Broadwell is no different. We've added two new instructions to allow our two 64-bit chained arithmetic computations to go through in parallel, and we cleaned up the flags to make sure that there's no funny behavior from a software perspective, uh, and, uh, and you, can, you can do high-precision arithmetic uh, faster. We also added, we added, uh, uh, we've improved the uh, throughput of the uh, latency of the uh, Carrier multiplier, which is uh, utilization in the Galois field uh, elliptic curve cryptography. Um, NIST released a new um, uh, uh, standard for uh, generating random numbers, so we implemented an instruction which generates random numbers to that standard. Of course, it also has a bit which tells you whether the uh, SOC was successfully able to uh, uh, create the random number, or if, if the carry flag is not set, then we try the instruction again. We've extended the supervisor mode execute protection to uh, uh, to access mode also. That way, even if malware gets hold of your ring zero control, it still can't see user data. And the picture on the right basically shows you within the last five years the speed of various key building blocks uh, 
for RSA, uh, RSA uh, uh, Montgomery multiplier style operations and AES uh, encryption and uh, elliptical encryption. We also uh, added, uh, and this is a, a fairly significant from a, a system perspective and a, a debug perspective, we've added uh, architectural capability for software debug on Intel CPUs which will be maintained in generations going forward. It allows very low overhead for tracing and it is also some, it's also been enabled with key uh, debug tools and uh, we're planning on enhancing it based on feedback for future generations too. The Intel transactional synchronization extensions was introduced on the Haswell family and we've increased the, um, uh, the throughput of them and also the range of operation to allow them to go faster and um, the overhead of write buffering, uh, if you're familiar with what this is, is also lower, which allows you, it's the net effect is multi-threaded code which has a lot of, uh, you know, either contested or uncontested locks just goes faster. Virtualization is another area. Um, again, these are slightly removed from the traditional client space, but since Broadwell is an architecture which spans uh, servers, we have uh, significantly improved the guest host translation times. We have improved the L2 TLB so that you don't need, you can have a larger number of uh, translations alive at the same time. We have improved the quality of service and fault tolerance features that were introduced on Haskell. And the picture on the right basically shows you the improvement in uh, in virtualized round trip, uh, you know, host to guest transaction of the generations. And it's uh, over the previous generation, we have uh, reduced it by over 400 cycles, and we continue to work on reducing this. The net net of this is your virtual machines run faster and take lower overhead, so you can run more of them, or you can run a few of them faster in your data center. Uh, the chipset, um, so the 14 nanometer uh, chipset, which is actually on 22 nanometer, but it is focused on, on power reduction significantly. As I said before, when the CPU is idle, the remaining part of the logic, system logic that's alive is the PCH, and we've uh, spent uh, large amounts of effort to make sure that we reduce that power too. And in addition, we have delivered uh, audio and DSP upgrades to uh, deliver more usages at lesser power and uh, also added uh, support for PCI Express uh, you know, storage, which previously required an add-in um, card. And all of this allows us to create thinner form factors and a lower power and the um, you know, Intel Core M fanless tablet. So just to summarize the CPU and the SOC section, um, uh, I hope you will agree with me that uh, the combination of process Microarchitecture system level power management, you know, um, delivers uh, an exciting set of features which uh, is uh, builds a foundation for a whole range of exciting form factors, not only in the tablet space, but also in the traditional U series and in the clamshell and soon to come in the server space too. I'll now invite my colleague. Innovations on, uh, on graphics uh, and the GPGPU or graphics and heterogeneous processing. Uh, subsequently, Hong will uh, talk about the media and uh, display innovations. So, um, so th the five key things which uh, I wanted to talk about mainly today, or uh, actually Hong and I want to talk about mainly today, uh, are, are, are listed on this foil and I'll go over each one of them uh, at a time. So the first thing is the performance per watt enhancements we get not only through the 40 nanometer process, but also all the micro innovations we have done. Uh, including uh, circuit innovations to support it. The second key aspect is the microarchitecture itself. Um, it, it is, uh, we, have, we have built a, a scalable machine. We have actually scaled it further from where it uh, stood on the Haswell uh, generation. Um, it continues to have both its uh, GT2 and GT3 variants. And uh, I'll go through this block diagram a bit more in detail when I get to the uh, microarchitecture section. Uh, this is a block diagram which you should have seen before. Uh, it has been presented in uh, past IDF, but there are changes and I'll go through it as I'm going through the different sections. The third thing I'll talk about is uh, heterogeneous processing, which is also known as uh, SVM, and it's supported through the OpenCL um, API. Um, and, uh, and there I'll be talking a little bit more about the microarchitectural changes we made in support of that. The, the, the fourth thing which uh, Fourth and fifth thing, which Hong will talk about in, in, in great detail, is 2x uh, faster and better quality in media. 
as well as uh, leadership uh, 4K end-to-end -end support. So, uh, so the very first thing I want to talk about is the uh, the advantage that 14 nanometer brings us, uh, and the and the uh, changes we made to the micro architecture to enhance the performance uh, per watt uh, behavior of, of the device. Now, 14 nanometer itself is. Uh, has significantly lower dynamic power compared to uh, the previous technology, and it has better leakage characteristics. The combination of those two can, graphics can take significant advantage of the combination of those two things. Uh, we can either uh, lower power at uh, compelling performance, or we can improve, the, uh, improve performance at uh, keeping the power the same. And, uh, and, and we have done all these in, in different segments uh, uh, of, the, um, of the 14 nanometer uh, product, which which may be the four and a half watt tablet to six watt to higher power um, um, offerings that will come out uh, later on. In, in addition to um, the inherent uh, benefits the process gives us, it, uh, it also provides us uh, with the ability to operate at lower voltages. And operating at lower voltages uh, without losing a whole lot of performance is again a great advantage to lower, uh, uh, lower power uh, for, for the, in the lower power segments. Uh, now, it, lower, lower voltage operation doesn't come for free. I mean, it requires significant circuit innovations in, uh, in both uh, 60 and 80 uh, um, RF and SRAM uh, configurations, uh, as well as significant work in hardening the uh, flops and latches in, in the standard cell libraries. Also, it, it's a great challenge to, uh, to lay out all the long wires with, at, at those low voltages and sustain the frequency. And all these are solved through uh, you know, significant innovations uh, in, 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 in circuit technologies. Now, on top of that, we have uh, a couple of key microarchitecture uh, innovations to reduce dynamic power. Uh, one, of the, one of the things we did was uh, reduce the toggle power in our compute blocks. And the toggling uh, aspect was, was reduced, or the dynamic power was reduced by looking at uh, the data types and the operations that were being performed on the data uh, to optimize out whether we wanted to keep the compute element off or on. And this was used uh, uh, significantly in the execution unit and also in other areas of the machine. So we all know that the, the, a significant portion of the power in the graphics controller is taken up by the clock network. We, we had significant innovations in the clock network uh, circuit itself to reduce the uh, power of each one of the clock buffers. And additionally, we added a, a level of clock gating uh, so that we can uh, quickly turn off as much of the clock network as possible when, when a particular module goes idle or, or dynamically goes idle for a short period of time. And this, in the end, leads to, again, reduction in, uh, in dynamic power when an application is actually uh, running. So, so, so summing it all up, the, the process, the circuit technologies, and the microarchitecture uh, innovations we have done enables new levels of uh, performance per watt on the 14 nanometer microarchitecture, and and you will see this in the four and a half to six watt to ten watt uh, you know uh, offerings as they come along. So the next thing I'm going to be talking about is the new graphics microarchitecture, and before I, I get into to, uh, to the specifics here, I just quickly wanted to talk about the this the block diagram you see. So. Um, so, so, so this block diagram is very similar to what we showed before. Um, you can see that on the left-hand side we have the, the fixed function uh, blocks all the way from uh, vertex fetch to uh, through the tessellation pipelines, uh, through the, uh, the clipping and setup. This is the traditional DX11.x uh, uh, fixed function pipeline. And, and the most of the center of the block diagram you can see three identical things there. And those are the sub-slices. And, and in between the sub-slices, there is a block there which is called slice common. Uh, I'll be going through um, the slice and the and the sub the sub-slice and the slice common a little bit later. But first, you know, uh, talking about the API support in the in the micro architecture, uh, we support all the latest uh, APIs as Srinivas mentioned before, 11.2, uh, it's DirectX 12 ready, OpenGL 4.3, OpenCL, um, OpenCL 2 as well. Actually, there is a there is a class I think tomorrow an idea which talks about uh, driver development on on DX12 that you guys can go to if you are interested. Um, now, on the fixed function itself, which is now circled by the yellow box, uh, we increase the, uh, the the performance of all the key building blocks there: the vertex shader, geometry shader, domain shader, and the tessellation fixed function by uh, by by two x. And uh, th this increase was not only to support the the scale up. Of the of the slices themselves, but it is also to in support of richer geometry we see in newer workloads. Now to talk a little bit about the subslice. 
the, the subslice in, in prior generation, uh, we had two subslices, and each subslice had uh, 10 execution <coughs> units each. Uh, of course, a subslice also has a textual sampler, an instruction cache, and, and a load store unit. On, uh, in this generation, we have three subslices, and each subslice has eight uh, execution units in it. So basically, for a given slice, the increase is from 20 to 24 AUs, or there is a 20% increase in, in flops. All, and however, since we have three subslices, we have a 50% increase in the, in, in the texture sampler performance. Um, in addition to the subslice itself, we made some uh, changes to the EU itself. We now co-issue a few more instructions, like compare, select, min-max, um, and also we doubled the integer throughput um, in the EU on, on this generation. So given that the, uh, we increase the flops by about 20% and increase the, the sampler throughput by 50%, the flop to text ratio changes from 40 to 1 on our prior generation to, to 32 to 1 on this generation. Actually, if you recall on Ivy Bridge, which was the generation before that, it was 32 to 1 as well. So we are kind of going back to that, uh, the same uh, ratios. So we also uh, added in a few hooks to improve GPGPU performance. Uh, one of the things we did was, uh, was uh, improved uh, the uh, Atomics performance significantly. Um, and also we improved the load store or scatter gather performance uh, uh, significantly as well, uh, both to local and, uh, and the shared local memory. Talk about the shared local memory. We um, increase the shared local memory footprint by 50% and increase its bandwidth also by 50% to, uh, to feed the subslices which it, it connects to. So that is not all. Uh, there is a few more things I need to go uh, over the microarchitecture. So there is another foil on that. And here I'll be talking mainly about the slice common. The slice common has the, the rasterizer. It has the high Z and Z units, uh, stencil. Um, it has the, the pixel ops or the ROB engines, as well as the shared um, L3 cache, which houses the shared local memory, as I just mentioned. Um, and also, uh, it has the caches for the uh, Z color and 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 and, uh, and those subsystems. So on the slice column, the first thing we did was improve the uh, high Z and Z throughput. Um, additionally, we improved the pixel backend. So the fill rate went up by 50%, and the blend rate uh, went up by by 100%. Um, in, in addition, we increased all, all the caches in, in Slice Common. The, the L3 size was increased, which is a shared cache for textures. Uh, we increased the size of the uh, depth and render caches as well. Uh, and, and all this is for Slice. So whatever I described here, the, the sub-slices and Slice Common is for Slice. Um, we can have two slices in a GT3 and, and all this just doubles over. On SLM, on uh, MSAA performance, we improved 2x, 4x and 8x MSAA. Uh, however, we continue to recommend uh, post-processing techniques like CMAA uh, because we, we still believe that uh, at these power levels, CMAA offers a better uh, quality performance trade-off relative to using hardware MSA. So, summing it all up, um, stating it again, we, we made significant uh, improvements in the microarchitecture, and we believe that the, the, the 40 nanometer microarchitecture will perform well across a wide variety of uh, benchmarks. And actually, we have seen that, uh, at least on the Y series, I can tell you that we have about 40% improvement in, in a variety of games and benchmarks related to the prior generation. So moving to the next file, and here I'm going to be mostly talking about uh, uh, heterogeneous processing uh, or, or SVM. So heterogeneous processing allows a, a, a programmer to write a program with, which uses the same virtual space across of the GPU and the CPU. Um, so the, the pointers have all the, used the same space, and hence the programmer doesn't have to think about it a whole lot. And second, when he's trying to move data from one uh, one processor's view to another processor's view, he doesn't have to actually move the data; it just lives wherever it is, and he just have to has to send the appropriate pointers. So, uh, for the first time, we have implemented uh, shared virtual memory on uh, on uh, Intel microarchitecture on Broadwell. And actually, I wanted to go through this block diagram on on the right side. So one of the things we added uh, for, to, in support of heterogeneous processing in the microarchitecture was a coherent cache in graphics. So the boxes in light blue you see on the block diagram, see, and we have a large cache which could be EDRAM, and then and, and, and finally we have the system memory. So this is the the coherent uh, memory subsystem which was on a an, on a prior generation. So on Broadwell we added this the uh, the light blue box which is the bottom circled in red, and that is the coherent load store cache. And, and, and using that load store cache, we support uh, CPU and GPU coherency. 
So from an architecture perspective, heterogeneous processing is supported through the IO Avenue extension. It enables shared virtual memory, um, allows us to specify and share the same page table across the IA core as well as the graphics controller. Um, supports cache, uh, snooping, and invalidation protocols, um, and all the other uh, uh, hooks we need to communicate either with a driver that manages this entire process or an OS that manages the entire process. The software stack itself that allows us to uh, expose these capabilities is OpenCL2 uh, with shared uh, virtual memory extensions. We support both uh, coarse and fine-grained SVM. Now, coarse-grained SVM would, would have the synchronization at a command level, whereas a fine-grained SVM would actually use uh, fences in the kernel itself. And, and when we do that, we require the, the, the coherent load store cache to, to achieve uh, fine-grained uh, synchronization of that nature. We also support uh, CPU and GPU atomics as synchronization primitives. And, uh, and last but not least, uh, we will enable system SVM as soon as the, our OSV partners are ready with the OS infrastructure needed uh, to support the, this kind of uh, initiative. <coughs> so there is a whole uh, class on SVM, I think it's on Wednesday as well, um, on, on heterogeneous processing, which you can all attend. Also, there is a white paper, there's a link on, on this point, which I'm sure you can access uh, if you want to get more information on, uh, on SVM. So, so recapping, uh, we enable a seamless heterogeneous pro processing or programming uh, for new applications which will be written to use uh, this kind of uh, environment. And now, at this point, I'd like to invite Hong to conclude with media and display. Uh, the key point uh, number four, we have uh, a detail which earlier is uh, 2x faster and uh, Better, pro, uh, better quality in the media space. So the so, uh, GPU compute part is very critical capability we have for uh, media application. Uh, if you look at the client system, media is a pr pretty much the yet another big class of applications, be it 3D, uh, 3D graphics, whether use a, a GPU compute. So the EU sessions, the sampler sessions, the media sampler all help to deliver that solution through the OpenCL and uh, through the shared virtual memory in the future. So here I will highlight uh, some additional function we build in the architecture to uh, deliver higher performance, higher quality, and also lower power for media. Here in specifically the three green <coughs> highlight boxes here, why it's called a media sampler, which is a fixed function that is accessible by the programmable, uh, programmable engine uh, execution unit. Uh, so that's really extension to traditional uh, GPU compute. Uh, another box called the media, uh, video quality, which is a uh, standalone fixed function for video processing, like noise reduction, uh, color processing enhancements. We bring that as standalone uh, in the previous generation that help us to bring a lower power, uh, power compute for those uh, class of uh, operations. In addition to that uh, uh, standalone video quality engine, we also have uh, something called a multi-format decoder, which is a video decoder encoder design to run in parallel with uh, a render engine. So uh, here I'll highlight uh, those fixed function addition to the uh, GPU computer, which is this one. The first one is uh, Intel uh, Quick Sync Video has been uh, introduced for quite a few generations. We continue to drive the performance and quality for the Intel Quick Sync Video. I'm pretty happy to see that uh, for the, uh, the 40 nanometer processor, we were able to deliver up to 2x speed up again for the uh, Quick Sync Video. That is uh, most driven by the media sample side. As I did mention earlier, with the three subslides per slice for GT2 config, we have uh, like a Core M a series, we're able to deliver uh, uh, 1.5x, 50% more uh, media sample. And how can we deliver 2x more performance? In the each uh, media sampler for the motion search engine, we call the VME engine, we have to double down the uh, pipeline for the integer search. That gives us effectively uh, a 3x speed up compared to the previous uh, generation for search. So when the workload is uh, media sampler limited or the uh, compute limit uh, in that space, we were able to push the performance up to uh, 2x, and sometimes it's more than 2x uh, speed up compared to the previous generation. On the video quality engine, we also doubled down the pipeline to make that uh, run as uh, 2x faster than the previous generation. That helps us to bring this uh, video quality capability 
uh, into the lower uh, power uh, segment, also matching the performance with our uh, video codec, which is quite important to do. Uh, in addition to use the video quality engine for playback, we also see a lot of vendors to use this for uh, pre-processing when you have uh, a video content that may be captured by a phone or captured with local uh, camera where the noise and the quality uh, requires some improvements. So we, we combine the video quality engine with our video codec uh, capability to provide the total solution. Uh, on the uh, multi-format codec, we add uh, VP8 hardware decoder uh, in, there, in addition to the uh, uh, traditional video format of like VC and VC1 and VC2. And uh, we see also pretty uh, big interest uh, again with uh, JPEG uh, decoding capability that uh, helps uh, either video conferencing or some uh, uh, photo uh, app processing couple functions. That uh, interest uh, span from uh, client side also see some uh, server customer also uh, uh, see the JPEG uh, decoding uh, usages. So uh, our EU design actually is uh, uh, going beyond traditional uh, GPU compute uh, uh, 3D render. We have very op optimized instruction set for media operation. So we allow this allow us an uh, engineer to design a software solution using the GPU acceleration to to do something new standard like a HPC standard H2000 H.265. So we were able to use GPU accelerator design to support up to 4K 30 HVC uh, decoding decoding function for some of the uh, 40 nanometer processor skills. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, we have other uh, skill of the design like GT3. For that, particularly to match with uh, a higher uh, system of bandwidth uh, delivered by EDRAM, we also match up with the screenshot uh, for the uh, lower part is the uh, you know, HD uh, decoding, we're able to decode uh, nine HD uh, streams uh, in that form factor. Or if you have a 4K ultra HD content, we're able to deliver four streams of that uh, with this uh, uh, core amp uh, uh, skill. And uh, on the uh, uh, transcoding side, uh, HD to HD transcoding, we're able to achieve a mod, uh, up to 2x speed up compared to previous generation. In the uh, usage, for example, here, if you have a 4K content, you want to do transcoding into uh, to, uh, HD uh, uh, AVC, we are able to do that uh, that to a uh, 2x real-time speed. So the transcoding is faster than real-time uh, transcoding function applied to the 4K content. And that uh, encoding function also allows us to bring the full HD wireless display uh, for those uh, form factor that allows uh, for the clone and also an uh, extended uh, mode uh, without, which means that you can drive both local screen and remote screen at the same time. That's enough performance under that uh, thermal uh, power uh, limitations. So another factor about this is really the performance, uh, power improvements. We also continue to drive the uh, quality of the encoder. Here's one example on the uh, on the uh, left hand side, on the right hand side, um, on my right hand side is the screenshot of the uh, uh, wireless display content. So you, you have your uh, typical uh, works, uh, 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 desktop, you want to project the uh, uh, remote using the uh, encoding of the technology. On the left hand side is the newer generation, uh, the new 40 nanometer process quality. And if I zoom in to the, this uh, screen here, you see that the uh, the text font is much readable uh, in the uh, next generation of process because we have to improve the quality. This is an extreme case. We are running as a HD at 30, uh, 1080p 30 frames per second at 500 kilobit per second uh, bandwidth. That was means, means what? If you do a wireless display, your local bandwidth of the wireless, uh, a wireless connection may fluctuate depending on the bandwidth of the uh, access point limitation. But here, you can sustain much wider uh, bandwidth range, can still deliver very high quality uh, wireless display. Another way to think, think about this uh, kind of quality, uh, quality improvement is uh, if you do video conference, now you can see the HD, full HD video conference at the 500 kilobits is possible for certain type of content. You can share the screen with really uh, nice uh, 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 bandwidth. Uh, in many countries that are out there, they don't have the full uh, uh, Connectivity at uh, 500 kilobit per second tend to be the uh, available bandwidth uh, for uh, for the uh, uplink. Yeah. 
And here's also a screenshot for the uh, other video processing function we have uh, in the video quality engine. Uh, the first top one is the uh, sharpness uh, capability. Uh, you can see that uh, you can see better with uh, uh, the cars and the bridges. It really enhances the uh, details of this one. And lower part is noise reduction. It's hard to see the uh, uh, noise um, because the projector actually removes some noise already. But the, the point here is that uh, all those functions used to be available as uh, traditional uh, desktop uh, uh, laptop form factor. By moving this function into a fixed function implementation and the top of the throughput of this function, we can do this for HD and 4K content with a pretty limited uh, power amount. Uh, uh, if you think about today's tablet and phone, people turn off those, uh, uh, they don't have those functions in the uh, form factor. Now Intel introduced those functions into the much uh, lower uh, thermal limited uh, environment. And the last uh, topic we have, uh, number five, is the uh, leadership end-to-end -end 4K capability. Here, for end-to-end, -end, you have to think about the content, uh, content processing, and also driving the monitor. So we have all the three aspects here as well. Codex support, display support, and also panel support. On the codex side, uh, ABC has a pretty efficient encoding-decoding solution we have. And we support uh, a 4K60, actually more than 4K1, 4K60 capability with our ABC solution. And uh, even uh, GPU accelerator uh, encoding decoding for HVC can also deliver 4K30 at certain scale of the uh, uh, 40 nanometer uh, of process graphics uh, uh, microarchitecture. On the display side, we drive the uh, display port 1.2 can deliver uh, ultra HD at the 60 hertz or at the uh, HDMI 1.4 as uh, HD, uh, ultra HD at 24 hertz. So that's really with connectivity of your uh, panel, either the embedded panel or external panel, we're able to do end-to-end -end 4K here. <clears throat> so here's a recap, uh, uh, Adit and I cover for you the five key points. Uh, enhancement on power performance, uh, performance per watt is key. The new microarchitecture, the new process really deliver that one. And we have leadership uh, API, particularly here on the GPU compute side, OpenCL.0, share virtual memory support. And the media side, we have a 2 faster performance, and at the same time, higher quality for encoding and also the video processing, pre-processing, post-processing in the very low power uh, limited, limited cases. And in that is the leadership of 4K and the support. With that, if you think about the three major applications you can consider, one is uh, 3D gaming, one is uh, GPU compute, and also the other one is the media application displays. You see that uh, on 3D side, the better performance per watt will really deliver much richer experience for 3D gaming in that uh, smaller form factor. 20% more compute on the EU side, 50% higher sample uh, throughput here to support that. And uh, better GPU compute, or uh, better uh, efficient uh, software support with uh, shared virtual memory, memory also deliver better media applications, allow the tool for uh, uh, software vendor to write better uh, application using the GPU. That's also going beyond media, like uh, imaging and the video analysis also really benefit for those GPU compute. In the end, we deliver end-to-end -end 4K solution, and uh, for media, a 20%, for 25% longer battery life for playback, and also uh, Intel Pixel Radio, we deliver up to uh, 2x as fast as speed for, uh, for those uh, for, for five factors. Okay, all, all of that, all of those uh, we've described so far, they can get in there in the sub nine uh, millimeter finest of tablet. So really the core brand, core uh, experience coming down to your hand with the tablet, which is uh, awesome uh, from this uh, 49 meter processor and also the uh, microarchitecture improvement on the, uh, this generation. I think with that, uh, we have uh, invited uh, Adichian, the students, come back.